Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is your host, Joe Moore. I hope you're all doing lovely. For this episode, I actually traveled all the way over to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and got to link up with Hamilton Morris. If you don't know who Hamilton is, you really, really, really need to check out Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. Brilliant show. Three full seasons now. And just a really bright, clever person. <laughs> really fun getting together with him. Uh, you'll see You'll see. we start out uh, kind of just laughing a little bit. And we get into some good jokes later. But yeah, Hamilton's done a lot. He does really great journalism and storytelling around individual compounds. Um, I think he got started kind of doing stuff for Vice in his early days and kind of just worked up to now having like uh, three seasons of this show. Hamilton's a real deal chemist as well, working in um, a lab in Philadelphia. I believe he said they were cranking out multiple new psychoactives, or at least <laughs> I think, well, you'll hear exactly what he says near the end. And for those of you who are curious, Hamilton Morris and I do get to talk about his involvement with Compass Pathways and you know why it's controversial, why his deal is slightly different from a lot of other people's agreements with Compass and find it quite interesting. So we go all over the map, but it's, uh, yeah, we <laughs> kind of talk about the documentary, talk about some other hopes and talk about Compass and yeah, talk about Hamilton's laboratory work now, which is really what he's wanted to do for a long time. I don't think we get into any vice drama, though that would be an interesting avenue to get into eventually. Yeah. So I hope you all enjoy this interview with Hamilton Morris. I really had a great time with Hamilton and and can't wait to record with him again. And um, yeah, if you want to support us, <laughs> the biggest thing you can do right now is uh, join us at Microdose Wonderland Miami. There is a really cool conference coming up in a, in a few weeks. And um, Kyle and I will be there. David from our team will be there. And it should be extraordinary. We are um, we have a coupon code that gets you twenty percent off your ticket. I believe it's just psychedelics today. Um, you can also use the affiliate link on our uh, welcome page, so psychedelicstoday.com/slash/welcome. And yeah, we would appreciate you coming. So we're a sponsor there, and we do need to sell some tickets. So it would help us a ton if you could. I'd love to meet you there, shake your hand, give you a hug if I could. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm really excited about going to this conference and we might actually even be on panels, which I just found out earlier today. It should be extraordinary. Yeah, anything else? Anything else? I think that's probably it. So yeah, this um this conference is a Monday and Tuesday. It is uh November 8 and 9. <laughs> Somehow I'm doing a red eye from Las Vegas on the night of the 7th over to Miami cuz I'll also be at the Meet Dalek conference. So Busy B. Hope I get a nap in. <laughs> and yeah, I'm I'm just generally excited about it. There's so many people I want to meet and um, hang out with. So I really hope I see you there. Again, it's on November 8 and 9. Use the code psychedelics today to get 20% off your ticket. And um, yeah, see you there. Uh, and yeah, all right. I guess on with the podcast and we'll see you all on the other side. All right. And are we at the... School of the Sciences. University of the Sciences. University of the Sciences. Yeah. Right on. Philly. Sounds like a fake. Uh, sounds like a fake I was thing. telling my friends this is where I was going and they thought I was making it up. <laughs> there is, yeah, there's even a Norm MacDonald joke about <laughs> the University of Science. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> Man, he's the best. Yeah, I was just outside a comedy store in L.A. like two, three days ago. R.I.P. Norm MacDonald out front. I'm psyched to see that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I loved him, man. <laughs> was um, uh, we could tell Norm Macdonald jokes for hours, but let's just keep rolling. <laughs> so Hamilton, I kind of want to talk about, you know, how did you come into this space of chemistry, drugs, and you know, film, even? Yeah, I mean, I've always been very interested in the subject matter, mm -hmm. and when I first started becoming really interested in psychedelics specifically. I mean, it started in high school, but by the time I was in college, I was aware that this was a very fascinating and important and impactful area, but also the way that it was handled in the media was almost exclusively by people who had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah. And that was just taken 
as a given. Like, of course, of course, if somebody is writing about psychedelics, they haven't tried them. They <laughs> have a negative opinion about them. Right. They're vaguely in favor of prohibition. They have no understanding of drug policy, certainly no understanding of the surrounding science. And that's just the way it is. I'm thinking Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew, of course, yeah, it was a you know very influential, I would say, negatively influential. Although I would like to go back and rewatch some of those episodes of Love Lion from when I was a child. I remember listening to that in the '90s, <laughs> and I don't know how flawed my recollections are. Maybe I'm being unfair to Dr. Drew, but I do have memories of people calling in and saying things like, oh, I just tr I just took ecstasy with my girlfriend and we had sex and it was the greatest experience of my life. Like, is that okay? <laughs> and, and he'd say like, well, you know, you just experienced more pleasure than you'll ever experience again. And it's all <laughs> downhill from here and it is a neurotoxin. So you're going to want to avoid doing that <laughs> yeah so dr drew is one i mean honestly he's not even the worst by right. a, by a huge margin there's you know things like there was a, a somewhat notable piece in rolling stone by um a journalist who later won an academy award for writing the hurt locker i'm trying to remember his name it's but you know it was kind of the classic story like a, a good christian boy who's got it all going for him. He plays baseball. He loves the Lord. And then he discovers 2CT7 and everything <laughs> falls apart. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that that story was directly responsible for the scheduling of 2CT7. So I was aware of how these stories supported prohibition dismissed any kind of rational scientific interpretation of the events and were actually causing so much harm. And I thought, okay, well, if somebody did something that was honest and scientifically informed, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be beneficial to everyone? And it was really not that hard to sell because people are interested in drugs. It wasn't like I had to convince an editor for <laughs> for years begging him hey i want to write about this subject and they said no 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 and so, uh, people love the subject it's very fascinating to most people so that was kind of the origin was let me do my best to tell these stories in a responsible way mm -hmm. and i started when i was you know very young 2021 20, and i've learned an enormous amount in the intervening decade did you have some chemistry background at that point Sure. I mean, you know, I, obviously I was, I was still an undergrad, so it wasn't like I had a, a super sophisticated understanding of chemistry, but I would also say it was probably substantially better than most people reporting in that area. And it continuously got better over the years, partially because, in fact, I would say almost entirely because I started working with Jason Wallach at this university, started actually doing lab work, and that gave me a much more complete understanding of synthesis and pharmacology and analytical chemistry, which really allowed me to push things further. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a really good skill set. And did you pitch directly to Vice? Yeah. I mean, at that time, there was a, a really brilliant editor named Jesse Pearson, mm. who came from a family with a lot of addiction. He was very interested in drugs. He had used heroin for a long time himself. And he was very supportive, as were a lot of the people there. I mean, it was, there's, there's a lot of sort of stereotypical ideas about the way Vice is, but it was a, at the beginning, it was a pretty damn small company. I mean, the editor in chief of the magazine was working in a converted closet and there was very little editorial interference. You know, you could kind of do what you wanted and yeah, it was a, a great opportunity to start figuring out how how being a journalist, or I mean, I don't even know that I would call myself a journalist, but it felt like having a license to be curious about things. Suddenly, I had a reason to ask questions that mm -hmm. otherwise were not purposeful in the eyes of 
whoever I was asking the questions to. You know, if you contact somebody and say, what's your best-selling mushroom strain or something like that, why would they respond? But if you say, oh, I'm writing an article about how the contributions of this specific mycologist have impacted the underground mushroom world, and I'm curious if penis envy is your best-selling strain and say, well, yeah, in fact, it is actually our best-selling strain. And then suddenly you're learning things because you have this license to ask questions that you otherwise wouldn't have. Right. And that's, you know, it's, it's like a separate sort of investigatory skill set. Like science is one way of answering questions. Journalism interviews are a, another way of doing it. And I just started trying to test out all these different methods for learning about this world that I found so fascinating. Right. <laughs> just incredibly informative. And you've done a massive service, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't always fun, but it was really, really helpful, I think, to the drug world in general and the psychedelic set to have somebody like you trying to do this intersection of like science, culture, journalism and influenced a ton of folks, I think, in a positive way. I hope so, yeah. And and the other thing is that, you know, there are people like Michael Pollan who I respect and like and they have a very specific agenda which is how do we best change the minds of like semi-conservative undecided middle american types that sort of person who would never use a drug that was not my tactic i never wanted to appeal to those people what i really wanted to do was to take areas, especially the most stigmatized ones, the areas that people wouldn't stand up for. And, and I thought, okay, well, no one is going to stand up for PCP. And yet... Brilliant episode. And yet it is a medically recognized fact that these associations with PCP and violence are basically a media fabrication and a racist and classist one at that. And... So I thought, okay, well, no one else is going to do this. I have nothing to lose. I'll do it. Same thing for methamphetamine. Same thing for synthetic cannabinoids. Same thing for most of these. So whenever there's been a drug, a danger drug or something that everyone feels very comfortable hating, I've always felt, okay, that's the, when everybody feels comfortable hating something, that's the time that you have to be most cautious because that's when people really get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you just read a few history books and you can kind of understand that kind of shaping. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I call yeah. it unoriginal hatred. <laughs> and I think it's one of the most dangerous forces. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah, I just finished a book uh, recapping the Afghanistan disaster. What was it called? The Afghanistan Papers. And it was just like how manipulated we were <laughs> and them. Meaning like the people in charge was insane. Very blunderful and that same set of people is doing the drug war and like running newspapers and everything keeping it down it really sucks so two episodes i want to chat about the pcp one first off the most amazing thing in there was that gentleman from the process church i had not seen somebody on video uh ever actually talk about the process church so i thought that number <laughs> that alone was super interesting and that he was a pcp head was unbelievable too. And what's really funny about Timothy Wiley is that he had done this really significant thing that was probably the major reason people wanted to talk to him. And I was totally not interested in that. And in retrospect, <laughs> I actually wish I were more interested in it because, you know, I've subsequently read a lot about the Manson family and the, it's contested, but the potential, at least ideological association between process and family belief systems. Mm -hmm. And I never once asked him a single question about oh. it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I knew about Timothy Wiley had nothing to do with Manson or process. It was because early on, maybe when I was a freshman in college or something, I started thinking, well, what is the deal with PCP? And if so many people use this drug in the 1970s and you only hear negative things about it, did anyone like this drug? What, what is going on here? And so I started looking for any articles that somebody had written saying, yeah, I've used PCP and I actually liked it a lot. And as you might imagine, there was very little out there except for an article that Timothy Wiley had written for High Times that they had rejected. 
<laughs> so, so he put it on his website and it was such a strange piece of writing. And I, and I remember bookmarking it and thinking, huh, well, this is really an interesting fellow, whoever this Timothy Wiley guy is. And, uh, and then I called him and he was so funny and so charismatic. And I thought, all right, all right, I think I'm going to have to make the, the trip out to spend a little time with this guy. And I feel like that was actually kind of the formative moment for me when I was making the actual Pharmacopia TV show, where I was like, this is what I like. I like talking to unusual people. I'm not interested in PR or propaganda. I don't want to, you know, th there's also this idea that you have to only show, you know, like the politics of respectability, this idea that we're, right. we're, we're a yeah. marginalized group. And so you can't show a crazy person using drugs. Then you're just supporting the prohibitionists. You have to show a Silicon Valley professional microdosing and then writing code because that's respectable. And that's what we need to show the world. You can't, you Boring. have to show somebody who's dying of cancer, who's undergoing psilocybin psychotherapy, who's coming to terms with their own mortality and growing closer to their family. Now there's of course, absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, I think it's very good to do that. But the flip side is if you only do that and you ignore every single person that has an unusual relationship to these substances, that's not journalism or anthropology or reporting the truth. That's basically propaganda. So on one hand, I have tremendous appreciation for the very real and important clinical work that's being done, but I also have uh, tremendous resentment for the people that would attack me when I showed something other than that because I thought, well, that's true and that's good, but that's also not everything that's happening. I never considered that about your show, like you receiving a ton of shit for some of those episodes. I, on the level, I'm like, this is the best like picture of some of these drugs I've ever seen. And like you get to see a broad spectrum and it's, yeah, it sucks that you're getting heat for it. Yeah. And the funny thing as well is, is you might think as an outsider, you might think, well, who's going to object to this? Well, it's going to be Christian mothers in middle America. Those are going to be the people that object to it. But that's actually not the case at all. It's, I have received no objection from law enforcement or conservatives. 100% of the opposition comes from within the psychedelic community. That's where all of the infighting and the discord tends to be localized, which is, I think, also interesting. So when, when I was, I remember getting... Uh, kind of nasty messages from a graduate student who's saying, how could you show this person? He's crazy. You're trying to legitimize these things and you just showed a crazy person who talks about dolphins using sand dollars as walkie talkies. That's not what we need to see in the news. And I think what we need to see in the news is truth. Since, since that episode, I've been able to actually have conversations with a number of PCP users, surprisingly normal folks. And I think we even were able to do two different articles on PCP and like the race impact of our narratives and a lot of those issues. It's just a really fascinating and I don't know, a abandoned psychedelic compound. Really interesting to well, me. Certainly abandoned by the kind of white psychedelic community. Right, totally. But there's a tremendous number of people that use PCP outside of that world. And this is Carl Hart, when he was promoting his book, said this a lot. Where is the psychedelic community defending methamphetamine, defending mm. PCP? And I thought, well, I mean, I, uh, I've tried. And it's, but it's also, it's not about defending necessarily. It's about contextualizing and not falling into these traps of drug elitism, which are almost exclusively racist and classist attacks on people that behave in a way that you consider undesirable and you don't want to be associated with them. And you see shades of this throughout most psychedelic rhetoric. You know, psychedelics are different from other drugs. They're not like the bad drugs. These are the good drugs. Well, on one hand, I do agree with that on some level, on the level that yes, they, they not only do not tend to cause addiction, at least the uh, classical serotonergic psychedelics don't cause addiction, they tend to treat it. Mm. So yes, there are very serious differences between them. But if we fall into the same moral binary, then we're ultimately no better than people that think that the distinction between licit and 
illicit drugs is a pharmacologically or medically <laughs> meaningful distinction. <laughs> it's like uh, certain folks don't actually want to evolve culture. They just want to like feel better in their community. Or it's, it's just a strange kind of tribal thing. Well, if you have a bad guy that you can attack, then you're saying, no, no, we're not like the bad guy. We're not like those <laughs> bad people. Th those are the bad guys. We're okay. We're only mm -hmm. in favor of this one thing that's okay. We're not into synthetic psychedelics. We're into natural psychedelics. <laughs> we're into plant medicines. This is a different, <laughs> we're not like those, those bad guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the medicine term and then the plant medicine term both kind of drive me bonkers. I don't really know what to do about it. I get it. But it's also like, what about acid, guys? <laughs> like, it's still great. I mean, most of the stuff, I get it. I get it because I'm also aware. I mean, I'm made aware mm -hmm. every single day over and over again each morning when I look at my messages. You know, I probably <laughs> receive, you know, a couple dozen messages every day. And it's a constant reminder of how little people know about this area that people really are very genuinely confused in a lot of ways. And it's not mm. because they're bad and it's not because they're stupid. It's just because they don't know. And They've inherited decades of drug war. Yeah. And that doesn't go away easy, I don't think. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> how to really handle that one. Well, another service you did was with Salvia Divinorum. Your episode there is kind of my reference. If someone's like, oh, that was that bullshit from the 90s or whatever. Like, Have you seen this? episode and this is like brilliant and it rehabbed the image i think quite publicly of the sub of the plant and that was another example where i think there's also a kind of weird it's another shade of the same problem that i was talking about earlier mm. where people said oh it's all these people filming themselves smoking salvia and putting it on youtube that's why it's illegal that you can't do that that's not sacred behavior it's like well, people should be able to do whatever they want, including film themselves using drugs and put it on YouTube. And then, but of course, this depends on a culture that's mature enough to recognize that you can't, you can't gauge the internal state of a person based on their external appearance. So mm. somebody could be drooling and uh, laughing hysterically and falling backwards in their chair, but they might also be having a transcendent experience that is having a positive impact on their life or a negative one. But the bottom line is that, you know, drug policy shouldn't be based on what people do or don't upload to YouTube. <laughs> right. Should be based on science or at least figuring out a way to have a safe supply. And um, I just didn't like this idea. Like it's their fault because they uploaded funny videos to right. YouTube. It seems kind of like that's really not the point. And then I also was really interested in that sociologist who had used those YouTube videos to do pharmacology work, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, he he would time how long people <laughs> held in the hits based on the YouTube videos mm -hmm. and then estimate the duration of the experience and that's use that cool. to create a kind of dose response curve, which is um, a really funny idea. You take this thing that most people would look at and say, well, that's so stupid. Teenagers smoking salvia and posting videos of themselves on YouTube, that couldn't possibly have any value to science. And then, and then you see, well, actually, this is a uh, quite useful to see people in a naturalistic setting using drugs the way they actually use them, not in a clinical trial, but among their friends at home and seeing how they respond to it. Right. Having that as like a alternate touch point to what they were doing at Hopkins. I, I forget if they published Salvia stuff yet, but it's going to be a great compare contrast, I think. I, I now want to jump into the 5-MEO episode which, um, the first one, I actually haven't watched the second one somehow. Oh, you have to watch the second I, one. I'm going to, cause I, I heard so many good things about it. So the first one, there's, there's a couple issues or I don't actually know how we want to go about this. I'd like to talk about the ecological impact and also Jerry Sandoval a little bit. Yeah. But let's talk ecological impact first. So you're wearing a cream shirt now, which I think is the group who helped publish the manual. Yeah. Yeah. And they've been doing some really great fundraising via t-shirts around like toad conservation. Yeah. I mean, this was a, a big project that the pharmacopoeia team and cream and Robert Villa, we all kind of worked together to get this project off the mm. ground. And it has raised at this point about $250,000 awesome. for the Michael J. Fox foundation for basic 
research on Parkinson's, mm. as well as maybe 50000 for the artist Gail Patterson. I was able to use the money from my t-shirts to pay for the legal defense of a chemist who was arrested synthesizing large quantities of MDMA and DMT, although he wasn't charged with the DMT for whatever reason, and also to pay uh, for research on Bufal various with the Tucson Herpetological Society. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good came out of this. A lot of money was raised, and I think it went toward really good causes. Right. Because what, what I'm seeing in the space right now is folks like Mike Tyson and others coming up and like hyping natural toad and desert grows back slowly. It's not like you're in, you know, a rainforest or in a lush place like uh, Pennsylvania, for instance. It's like slow and a delicate ecosystem. And I'm a little nervous about these things, you know, becoming even more threatened than they are currently. Robert's helped me <laughs> become paranoid about it. I think the paranoia is warranted because some people say, oh, well, the, the you know, the data isn't in mm. or aren't in. And we need to do more research before we can say that they're truly threatened by human interference. But I think if you look throughout medicinal history, there's a pretty clear pattern that emerges, especially with medicinal animals. With plants, you can use agriculture to solve some of these problems, although it sort of depends on the plant. With animals, the results are almost always catastrophic. Rhinoceros horn is an obvious example. Pangolin scales is another example. The scrotum frog of Lake Titicaca has been driven almost entirely to extinction, has no pharmacological activity whatsoever. This mm. is just a, a thing, a kind of interesting looking frog. And people put it in a drink called Rana y Maca. It's just a frog dropped into a blender with maca. And uh, this is very, very popular. It's decimated the wild population. And this is for something that does nothing. So what happens when you have a, a toad that reliably induces a religious experience in users? I think it's pretty mm. easy to do the math and figure out how this could be a big problem. And this is still a niche community. Mm -hmm. So what happens when it starts to grow, which it is. So that was kind of a big part of this emphasis was this preemptive effort before things got out of control. Because by the time things really get out of control, it's often too late. And I thought this was a really simple instance of a material, a natural material that could be synthetically replicated easily. And the entourage effect, I think, is like a, a very, very fascinating concept because it's a sort of materialist revitalization of spirituality. So we live in a materialist society. We don't believe in plant spirits. But what if you say the entourage effect? That's kind of the same idea. The plant <laughs> contains something that an isolated chemical never could. It's some special cocktail of substances. It really is a kind of like neo-vitalist concept. And that's not to say that it's totally without scientific value. It, I do think that there are legitimate arguments in some instances for some organisms for an entourage effect. But I also think the term is widely misused in a pseudoscientific fashion. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, it's ugly how regularly people are saying it with no evidence whatsoever. I've reviewed some of uh, Decrim Nature's evidence around entourage effect in plants, and I've found it really lacking. There's nothing really great there. Yeah, and in this lab, um, before 5-MeO-DMT was illegal, you used to be able to buy reference samples of Bufal various venom from Sigma Aldrich. Now you can't anymore. We bought a sample. Jason Wallach and I got a sample, and it was nothing but 5-MeO-DMT on mass spec. And then... I collected samples subsequently and tested them, and there were other components that identifying natural products based exclusively on mass spec or GCMS is not ideal. You have to do a lot of work to definitively characterize the structures, but based on previously published analyses by Vittorio or Spamer in the 60s, it was in line with a number of compounds that are extremely unlikely to exert any degree of psychoactivity. So there was like 
serotonin O-sulfate was one thing that was found in trace quantities. Bufoviridine was another. And then you sometimes encounter these indole acetic acid derivatives that are extremely unlikely to cross into the brain or exert any kind of serotonergic activity. So when you really look critically at the chemical composition of the venom, you are left with two candidates for major contributions to the psychoactivity. There's 5-MeO-DMT, and then there is trace bufotinine. Uh, <laughs> in bufo various. In other species, there's no 5-MeO-DMT, and in some instances, quite a lot of bufotinine. Mm. That's super interesting. Huh. Well, it's great you're able to do that research here. And this has now been corroborated several times in, in peer-reviewed articles. And bufotinine is quite a bit less potent by weight than 5-MeO-DMT. So an active dose of bufotinine might be somewhere in the ballpark of 50 milligrams. Probably threshold is about 20 to 30. And an active dose of 5-MeO-DMT is, you know, usually 15 milligrams is the the dose that people cite as being the desired dose. Sometimes people go up to 20, but 15 is kind of the solid dose that will cause most people to have a sort of transcendent experience. So at a dose that would contain 15 milligrams of 5-MeO-DMT, you're dealing with less than a milligram of bufotenine, so a much smaller quantity of a much less potent compound. The contributions are going to be minuscule if present at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware of some studies showing that there's no subjective difference in the experience. I think uh, Malin Utaug at uh, Maastricht University, I think now at Imperial, put that out. Did she? Yeah. I th I'm pretty oh, sure. I need to look that up. I was talking with her. I, um, I didn't see that she'd publish anything on that, but that's it. A lot of people had said, well, okay, do that study. And you could do that study, it would be extremely expensive and time consuming and difficult and you'd need to, it would be a very difficult study to do. I think I, it was all naturalistic reports. Yeah. So, you know, no actual real. To do the double blind, I mean, to do the carefully mm -hmm. where, the, where, right. where the concentration of 5-MeO-DMT is carefully controlled in both samples. I guess that's a hard argument to make to any kind of ethics group or even funding group, right? Yeah, I think that there's more important questions to answer than that. At the same time, I never would want to discourage anyone from doing real research on psychedelics, even if I consider it slightly frivolous. But yeah, I would bet that the difference is not substantial. I mean, mm. I don't really understand pharmacologically how it could be, but, and having tried both, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason to believe that really. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, I tried this and I tried that and they were different. Well, of course they were different. What would you expect? It's, it's actually kind of interesting how within this like neo-vitalist slash animist concept of the activity of plants, people dismiss their own psychology entirely. It's something that is not brought up. I, I actually, for whatever reason, find this very commonly in the dissociative community more than um, any other sector of the psychedelic world. People will, will say, oh, I tried this ketamine and it felt, uh, it felt kind of sedating. I think it's it's a little R heavy. There's a little more R in antium or ketamine. I've been hearing that, yeah. And or like, oh no, this was really this is there's definitely more S in antium or in this. And I'll say, well, did you do you have a polarimeter? Did you look at the optical activity? Do you have any <laughs> reason to believe this, or are you arbitrarily assigning these basically fabricated? psychopharmacological values to these enantiomers and then saying based on your so where r is sedative and s is psychedelic and so if you have a more sedating experience you assume that it is uh, predominantly r enantiomer ketamine this also doesn't really make sense synthetically either but i think it's the real reason that this is interesting is that people are dismissing their own psychology entirely and attaching all value to the molecular identity of the drug and this is coming from someone who is a uh, staunch materialist who spends all of their time thinking about the molecular identity of drugs. And I can tell you, this is crazy. Like the human mind is a huge contributor. If you take the exact same dose of LSD every year, I would be amazed if it's the same. I would bet against any resemblance between these experiences because you will be different. You will be in a different mood. You will be thinking about different things. You change all the time, much more than the drug. I've been seeing it a lot in the LSD world too. 
you know, I, my opinion is it, if it's LSD, it's LSD, like all these other kind of fluff or whatever other kind of label people are putting on it just seems kind of goofy to me but it's a big part of the culture. Unless you have some kind of analytical confirmation or you've done actual research. I mean, there's there's so much. And, and this is, again, I'm not trying to say people are stupid or anything like that because this is a world that has been dominated by folk pharmacology and folk chemistry yeah. for so long that you can't really blame people for having developed their own interpretive framework in this vacuum that uh, hasn't been addressed by science for so long. So... People will say, okay, ISO LSD makes this or that contribution. Well, you know, the first step in making that assessment is trying pure ISO LSD and characterizing what kind of effect that has. And then maybe trying a 50 50 ISO LSD LSD combination and seeing if that's different aside from the potency differences that would be expected. I mean, there's, there are careful experiments that could be done to answer these questions. But what I typically see is people have built a shaky foundation for understanding the psychopharmacology of these things where usually they're not even understanding them on the most basic level, which is dosage and chemical identity. So people will say a blotter is 100 micrograms of LSD. I've seen nothing but evidence to the contrary. If you look on drugs data, Actually, you might know the answer to this. I reached out to them to talk to them about this and they haven't responded to me. But you know, their whole thing is that they can't quantify drug concentrations. Yeah. It was like a weird ratio thing last time I looked. Yeah, so they, they only have ratios, but not any kind of quantitative information about the dosage in mm -hmm. various substances, except for LSD. Except really? for LSD. And I don't know- What was that about? I don't know. I contacted <laughs> them to ask. I haven't heard a response. But if you look at their LSD analyses, it is mm. quantitative. Um, there's also some difficulties in doing that. Uh, Jason Wallach published a great paper in a series called Return of the Lysergamides, where we did, uh, I was not a co-author, but I contributed to the work a little bit. And we did quantification of the concentration of lysergamides on blotter that had been provided by a gray market distributor. And this was someone who's really, I actually know the person who did this and they're brilliant. They're not, you know, someone who's doing this kind of thing sloppily with a bottle of Everclear in a hotel room uh, next, <laughs> next to a, you know, like Grateful Dead concert. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But this guy is a very serious and careful person. So the point is that variation should be assumed in the dosage on these blotters. And if you look at the drugs data, quantification the only thing you can conclude is that LSD is never 100 micrograms on a <laughs> blotter. That is the one number that was never found. They have everything in between, but never 100. So I would say, instead of assuming that it's 100 micrograms, I would ass assume that it's anything but 100 micrograms. <laughs> what kind of range? Like 25 mics to like 250? It's, or... yeah, it's, yeah, I think that's actually pretty close to what I, right. what I saw, but I encourage people to look for themselves. Right, and... <sighs> You can't ever take less. <laughs> so be careful out there. So back to five. So the episode didn't necessarily address the delicate, this first episode, I think you revisited it in the more recent one, didn't really uh, address how delicate the ecosystems are in the Sonoran Desert for the toad. Like, But it seems like you tried to address it, but maybe it didn't make it through the editing room. Process. We, we started, it's been a couple of years since I've watched that mm -hmm. episode in its entirety. I mean, I know that the end of the episode concluded that it has to be made synthetically, that that's the only way to do it. And I wanted to film the synthesis. I actually had a an a irrational urge to synthesize 5-MeO-DMT after I smoked mm -hmm. the Buffal Various Venom. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was like overtaken by this urge. The only thing you could <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, there's, of course, the problem that it is a crime to do so in the United States. But I started thinking, okay, I've spent all this time doing chemistry work. Wouldn't it be nice to use my skills to do something that's good for the planet and good for everyone, maybe? So I started contacting people that were running clinics in Mexico. And I said, uh, I know a lot about tryptamine chemistry. I'm happy to synthesize as much 5-MeO-DMT as you want as long as it's all done openly, above board. I don't want to hide anything. I want to do this 
with legal approval and I'll do it completely for free. And, uh, and I was surprised that no one took me up on the offer. Or when they did, they would do it in a sort of sketchy way where they'd say, okay, I can get, you know, I, I know a guy who, like, he's very discreet. And I'd say, no, this isn't about discretion. I want to, this is the opposite of discreet. I want to do this completely openly. And because I think, again, that's part of, part of what I'm trying to do is if you are free to do something, you should do it. If you don't live to the extent of your freedom, then you are letting the prohibitionists win. You're letting them win battles they haven't even fought. If they can keep everyone so afraid that they don't talk about this stuff, that they don't do the things that they're actually free to do, then we're making things quite a bit easier for them. And sometimes I'll, I'll get messages from people saying, oh, you know, I, I really liked something that you tweeted or I really liked something that you wrote, but I, I would be afraid to retweet it because if my employer saw it, then I, I could lose my job. And, and I wonder, I mean, I'm sure in some instances that is true, but I think in many instances, people are so afraid that they don't recognize that they actually can be open about these things. Mm -hmm. And your show helped. Yeah, I wrapped a 20-year software career where I, I maybe told three coworkers over the course of that period of time my interests. And that's pretty fucking crazy. But I was still producing this show for years while having, you know, their revenues. And I was pretty public with my name, using my real name everywhere. And they never caught me somehow. Um, so for those of you out there, if you're not going to be doing a crazy big podcast, like you're probably fine. You're probably completely fine. Yeah. And you don't need to be a zealot. You don't need to stand on a soapbox or go around Mexico trying to synthesize 5-MeO-DMT or whatever, but you also don't need to live in fear. Oh, there's so much interesting stuff here. So, okay. So then in the second episode, I demonstrated a synthesis mm -hmm. that is a modification of actually a route that was developed by pharmaceutical chemists for the synthesis of the anti-migraine agent, mm -hmm. rizotriptan. It's a very, very simple route, which I think some people didn't understand. I would get all these messages from people saying like, oh, you, you think that chemistry is so sophisticated? That's easy. And it's a, it's the whole point. This is the whole <laughs> point is that it's easy. I want it to be easy. Let me brag about how good I am in a lab. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone, the, that's the beauty. Anyone can do something in a difficult way. Mm -hmm. The beauty comes from doing something in a simple way. And so this is a, a process for the synthesis of tryptamines that is pretty approachable. And that was kind of the idea. It was, you know, if you think that toads are the only source for this stuff, you're wrong. There's another way to do it. And this is the way that should be pursued if this is going to continue to gain popularity at the rate that it currently is. Mm, agreed. Yeah. I'm aware of kind of dealers that actually sell both somehow. I find that interesting and a nice transition. But yeah, we're just really not at a place where we should be buying that stuff, I don't think. Do you have any more insight into the historical discontinuity of use of smoked 5-MeO? Like, is it proven pretty well that there's not a long history of use of smoked 5-MeO DMT? This is also very much uh, debated, and I have spent an enormous amount of time researching it. Mm. So there's maybe, there's sort of three different threads to the 5-MeO-DMT okay. historical narrative. The first is an indigenous history. So if you include various plants that contain 5-MeO-DMT, then the use can be dated back at least hundreds and probably thousands of years. But the problem with that is that all of these plants contain other active substances like DMT or bufotenin in addition to the 5-MeO-DMT. So this is a different sort of experience. When it comes to bufoalvarius venom, I think that the history can be very precisely pinpointed to the contribution of one man, Ken Nelson. Mm. Um, how he got there involves other people. So there was a Italian chemist named Vittorio Spamer you familiar with him? I know the name. Discovered a little thing called serotonin. Oh, kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which he called enteramine. And, uh, and he had done really important early research on the chemistry of Bufo alvarius. Mm -hmm. So he was 
as far as I know, I believe it's been a little while since I've reviewed this literature. So forgive me if I'm making a, a small mistake, but as I recall, he was the first person to detect 5-MeO-DMT in Bufuel various venom. And Ken Nelson saw a monograph that had been published called Evolution in the Genus Bufo that contained all of this analytical research that had been done by Spamer. So he thought, well, wait a second. And he, and okay, the third thread. So thread number one is indigenous. Thread number two is Bufal various. Thread number three is synthetic. So there was also synthetic 5-MeO-DMT. It was not a controlled substance. It was sold by various chemical supply companies. So starting in the 70s, there were mail order suppliers of 5-MeO-DMT. This was not popular, but it was done occasionally by psychonaut types in the 1970s. I think Andy Wheel said he had it pretty early um, when I chatted with him a while back. So yeah. it was probably through this route. Yeah. So so you had that. So he was aware that 5-MeO-DMT was a substance that was done. And then he reads this monograph. Wait a second. It's also present in the venom of a toad. Then to mm. further complicate this already somewhat complicated narrative, there was a, an anthropologist named Jeanette Rundquist. And she had done an excavation of a Cherokee midden pile and had found an enormous number of toad bones in it. And she hypothesized that these toad bones were the product of the use of the toads as a drug. And this got a little bit of uh, press in Omni magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with Omni magazine. It's it's cool. It was it was kind of like um, what Bob Guccione, the... Um, penthouse editor mm -hmm. had like a science magazine oh, uh, kind perfect. of like kind of like wired for the, mm -hmm. the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. and they would publish wacky drug stories so look at this an anthropologist just found evidence of ancient psychoactive toad use so it got a little bit of press that's where ken nelson first found out about it as it turns out that anthropological analysis by runquist was flawed and all contemporary evidence points to the use of those bones being a product of consuming the toads as a food source, not as a drug. Mm. Bufo alvarius, was there? Was oh, it? and also, crucially, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Crucially, these were not Bufo alvarius bones. It, was, it would have been uh, geographically impossible. So this was, a, you know, it was an interesting hypothesis, but it is, has not stood up to any sort of right. scrutiny. But that, that's another thing that I find so interesting about this story is you have a mistake that is made. And that mistake inspires a very real discovery. So he reads this article in Omni, ancient use of toad psychedelics. He reads the Bufo monograph, sees that there's a species that contains 5-MeO-DMT, and he puts two and two together and realizes, I can do what these people were doing in the past. Mm. I can use these toads as a drug. And he is the first person to milk the toad and smoke the venom and show that that is a viable way to use it as a drug. And he writes a small book. It's locally known in Texas. It's known among psychonauts. People like Andrew Weil and uh, Wade Davis recognize it. And, and then it kind of fizzles out. People, it's an oddity. People pick up on it, they mm -hmm. are interested in it a little bit, but it's not a phenomenon. And the kind of major resurgence of this comes with Sandoval and Reddig, and I suppose Mike Tyson as well, and, and the, the uh, raised profile as a result of a lot of celebrities having these profound experiences with mm. Bufal Various. It helps it's not a far drive from Los Angeles, I guess. It's probably problematic. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it, just to be transparent, Reddick and Sandoval um, have been pretty well documented as being having a lot of issues in the space. Um, Certainly, yeah. That, that website, 5MEODMTMalpractice.org is down. <laughs> We're trying to find a new home for it. If anybody wants to host a website, reach out. Yeah. And, and this is another problem. This is, you know, I remember when I first moved to New York. It was kind of during the height of Daniel Pinchbeck's popularity. And that was when these phrases like plant medicine were really taking off. And there was an idea 
that was uh, profoundly drug elitist in its delivery, which was that the drugs that we're doing are not drugs. Right. These are medicines. These are ancient, ancestral healing modalities. And to call them drugs is to desecrate something that is in has bears no resemblance to the things that you call drugs these are medicines and if you want to do it it has to be traditional and for it to be traditional it has to be in south america you have to get on a plane you have to go to south america and then you have a traditional transformative ayahuasca ceremony and it became a sort of uh status symbol a competitive status symbol oh you went to iquitos mm -hmm. and, and you had an ayahuasca. how long were you there oh you only did one i i really find the best therapeutic transformation comes from 10 consecutive ayahuasca ceremonies, but you have to really go deep in with the Shipibo if you're going to really have the authentic experience. And then, you know, and then everyone is kind of trying to demonstrate that they have one-upped uh, the the previous outsider and the authenticity of their ayahuasca experience. And early on, I recognized that this was uh, both wasteful and dangerous, partially because there is no text of shamanism that you can refer to and say what is legitimate and what isn't legitimate. So you have all these outsiders who, even if they were actually very invested in reading all the anthropological literature and really cared and were serious, I, I, again, I'm not even saying these people had to be stupid, but suppose you've read everything that's ever been published and then you get to the ayahuasca center and the shaman says, I'm actually from, I'm, I'm a Martian. And, uh, and I come from a long line of Martians and part of my healing modality has to do with my connection to Mars. And who are you to say, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. That makes you, you're not from Mars. That's not true at all. You're from a different culture. You don't really know what makes sense. What is a manipulation? And people did get hurt. I mean, there was the, the famous case of Kyle Nolan who died and had his body buried. Is that at Chimbre? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I thought that that was emblematic of the problem. And so why was I getting on this tangent about plant medicine? Like a danger pinchback. Yeah, it's, it's just like us, you know, Westerners getting manipulated by various, you know, stories, I guess. Well, anyway, Blanked. maybe I'll, maybe I'll remember it. But one point is that this also dismissed the very real possibility that people could have equally healing, transformative experiences in their own culture. Mm -hmm. And that we don't need to have a xenocentric view of these things where we completely dismiss ourselves and our own understanding of our environment and what mm -hmm. is comfortable and good for us. I think that there is a tension between appreciating the people who have a history or at the very least a perceived history of doing these things and recognizing what traditional knowledge they have and how it can be used to inform our own practices mm -hmm. and completely dismissing our own intuition and our own understanding of what is beneficial. You know, I, I hear this kind of all the time that there was, yeah, this sort of almost masochistic desire to go through the most intense imaginable experience because that was perceived as more authentic and less like what would be traditionally considered drug use. It's not drug use if it's painful, right? That makes it different. All right, I have to burn my skin and then vomit a lot. And then that was not drugs. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's... <sighs> I think it is like a, a sign of our culture. People are just so disempowered and disconnected from so much that they have no idea how to get a handle on it. And anybody that'll show them how, just to jump right in. Might have been Sandoval and Reddick. Oh, oh, right. Okay, yes, that was it. That was it. Thank you. So I think a similar thing happened with Sandoval and Reddick where they introduce a perceived history that makes the idea of smoking toad venom more digestible because look, there's a, a carved stone toad from somewhere. And that shows that people have been doing this for a very, very long time. So don't worry about it. And, and people put all of their trust into these strangers. And now I remember what I was really saying is that there was an idea that you had to have a shaman, that, you, that this makes it, again, this makes it separate from you know, using cocaine at a party because you're, you have a healer, you have somebody that's mediating the experience in some way and distances it from these uh, bad drug type of uh, tendencies. And the reality is that a lot of these shamans were extremely untrustworthy. And 
one thing that I struggled with in doing this is it seemed like any shaman I spoke to would have some kind of, even if I didn't know about it at the time, once the episode came out, someone would say, how could you? What were you thinking? Don't you know what he did to so-and-so? And I'd think, of course I didn't know. But, but, but what I really realized was, uh, okay, this seems to be a pattern for everyone, like virtually everyone in this kind of plant healing space. And so my overarching message was one of self-empowerment and trying to help people recognize that they don't necessarily need a mediator. Of course, it helps, especially it's easy for me to say that I've dedicated who knows how much time to thinking about these things. And mm -hmm. it's completely unrealistic to expect other people will spend a decade reading about this so that they feel empowered to do it on their own. And of course, it also helps to have a sitter or to have somebody. There was actually a tragic death recently of somebody who died, someone who I didn't know well, but I had talked to on a couple of occasions. And it at least preliminarily appears that he died smoking Bufal various venom. I've heard uh, this rumor. Um, yeah. And in alone and set himself on fire while he was doing it. And it's, you know, so there's no question that it, it's, but there, but there's a in between ground between entrusting your safety to a complete stranger and doing something completely alone. And the middle ground is a trusted friend. Right. I really like, uh, Ralph Metzner talked a lot about these kind of um, egalitarian groups. And I think that might be a huge part of the future. I'm kind of making it a team sport to a degree, but um, just with safety in mind. Yeah. So with the a little bit of time left. We can talk. I, the okay, cool. Spent, yeah. I kind of want to talk about Compass um, and just see how we want to dig in yeah. um, to that topic. Sure. You've been getting a lot of heat online about heat, um, yeah. joining up. And uh, I don't know. I feel like I might be one of the more fair people to chat with about it. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long story. Mm -hmm. I do plan to talk about it in detail on Good. my own podcast at some point. But... The basic radically condensed explanation, which people don't understand, and it's not their fault because they don't know me in my entirety, mm -hmm. but I've had a public life that has included making documentaries and writing articles and appearing on various podcasts, but I've also had a private life. Mm -hmm. And the private life has been very much oriented around chemistry and working with a chemist named Jason Wallach, who's brilliant and a very close friend and someone who I consider responsible for so much of my knowledge in this area. Mm. And I've worked with Jason for 11 years at this university and there's no funding for this sort of research. Mm -hmm. The passion was there. I mean, I was doing this, not, not only doing it for free, I was losing money. I would take what little money that I had, uh, you know, left over from pharmacopoeia and I would donate it to research or we'd get someone like Tim Ferriss would donate a little bit of money to do research. And that mm -hmm. was always um, greatly appreciated. But the reality was that, you know, we were worrying about whether we had enough money for solvents to do mm -hmm. these reactions. And on top of that, it never occurred to us that anything that we were doing could ever be a medicine despite the fact that we both believed in mm -hmm. the medicinal value of psychedelics. So what was the best case scenario 10 years ago? The best case scenario was you publish a scientific article and a Chinese research chemical vendor sees the article and they synthesize one of the substances that you describe and it appears on the gray market and some people get to try it and some reports get posted on Reddit. That was the best case scenario. Was that a tactic people pursued? What do you a mean little bit to tactic? get to get um like was that kind of did people want to see it show up in the gray market so they could get those kind of um, subjective reports from the field? No, I would okay. not say that. Right. But there was an awareness right. simply because that has, it happened with Shulgin, it happened with Nichols, mm -hmm. and it's happened with articles I've co-authored with Jason. Then it appears on the Chinese gray market. Uh, a number of compounds from Jason's dissertation have appeared on the Chinese gray market. That was not something that Jason wanted, but there was an awareness that if you publish information on novel substances that are not controlled, that it will be noticed and 
there's a chance it'll appear on the gray market. It's just happened again and again throughout history. And you'd have right. to be very naive not to recognize that as a possibility. So that was kind of, but that when I say best case scenario, I mean best case scenario, uh, not from a toxicological or public health perspective, mm. but from a human use perspective. Like there's, there's no way these things are going to be medicines. Best case <laughs> scenario, they're going to be a gray market commodity for a couple months and then they're going to disappear into obscurity. Now there's a chance that some of this research could actually become a medicine. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is a very good thing. And having the money for this research, also a very good thing. So we're doing all the same research that we've been doing for so long. Mm -hmm. The only difference is now we have resources to actually do it. And it's attracting mm -hmm. all these other brilliant chemists. There's a woman from the Czech Republic named Yitka who came here recently, who's so passionate. She's here, you know, working. 13 hours a day, every mm. day. And, and, and that's kind of the, the funny thing is everyone's saying it's all about money, it's all about money. Well, maybe for some people, it's all about money. Mm -hmm. But for us, I, I know this is like hard for people to believe, <laughs> but there is genuine passion. I don't know why that would be hard to believe considering how long we've all been involved in this, but it's incredibly exciting to do these things that we could never do previously. And now mm -hmm. we have the resources. And so I just say that on a research level, on the larger corporatization issues, it's complicated. And I have no interest in acting as a PR person for Compass. But what I will say is that the research that I'm doing with Jason is something that I'm very proud of and something that I think that anyone who understood what we're doing would be very excited by it. So are you... You're working for Compass to, and they're helping to fund your research here. Is that kind of the story? Uh, not quite. I'm actually okay. working here. I'm a, now a graduate student okay. and I am working for the university, okay. but also doing, and the and the and Compass uh, sponsored research okay. at the university. So it's, it's really, I'm actually working at the university and then I do uh, consulting for Compass, but actually for the record, I haven't even received a penny from Compass for any of this. And, and, <laughs> and I'll say one other thing. I say this somewhat cautiously, but uh, because there's this idea that you would only do it for money. Mm -hmm. There was, I want to say his name, but I also don't want to cause him any problems. But there, there was a, a, a well-off individual who's very passionate mm -hmm. about psychedelics. And he said, you know, if you start doing this, it's going to cause you so much shit that I will match every dollar the compass pays you just for you not to have any association with them. Because I think that, and I know this sounds like some kind of a horrible, <laughs> humble brag or something, but it's true. This really did happen. Right. And it wasn't an offhand remark. It was something that was seriously discussed with lawyers. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, uh, the reality was that it wasn't, you know, if I, if we're about money, I would have just taken this guy's money and done whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't about that. It was about working with Jason something that I've wanted to do for so long mm -hmm. and have never uh, been able to do it outside of little stints on the weekends between other projects. And mm -hmm. I would think, wow, if I can do this much in one weekend with no money, what could I do in a year with actual resources to do it? And it's happening. This is not a hypothetical scenario. In the last three months, we've synthesized more psychedelics than in the preceding three years. And Whoa. it's averaging tens of novel serotonergic compounds, I won't say psychedelics, but let's say 5-HT2A agonists. And the pace is really exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's a, that's like the, you know, I, I understand and I actually am happy about the vigilance of the psychedelic community. And I think it is important to, to keep an eye on these things and make sure that everyone behaves in an ethical manner. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there's something a little bit surreal about, you know, waking up each morning to invent new psychedelics and people thinking that's a, a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, but, you know, and, and it's, it's part of the, it's part of, you know, Brian Roth does research on serotonergic psychedelics mm. with a DARPA grant. Nichols would accept money from NIDA. Nichols also, of course, works with Compass and is the author of the psilocybin patent or co-author of the psilocybin patent. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> this is the thing is like you have a kind of a, a fringe group of moralists and then the people that have really dedicated their lives to this are on board. Is you know, this isn't it's not Bill Richards saying don't do this or 
or David Nichols, they have some concerns, as does everyone. But I think, mm -hmm. that, and of course, Shulgin's lab is now a pharmaceutical company. The lab of Dalibor Samus at Columbia is now a pharmaceutical company. In fact, it's hard for me to find a single, William Leonard Picard consults for psychedelic pharmaceutical companies. Ethan Nadelman consults for psychedelic pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. Robin Carhart Harris, David Nutt, Amanda Fielding has her own company. I mean, it has, this is actually one of the things that I, kind of wanted to cover in the third season, but I decided against it partially because of my concerns about a conflict of interest, but also partially because I didn't, I felt it was the, the biggest story in psychedelics overnight. Everyone is involved in some attempt to commercialize things and we'll see how it all goes. But I think it's very naive and short-sighted to dismiss this as a bad thing mm -hmm. when the reality is that 90% of the country has not used a psychedelic and probably a significant portion of that 90% would not use it unless it were under some kind of FDA approved, mm -hmm. completely legal, completely regulated circumstances. And I don't think that the commercialization or pharmaceutical approval needs to exist at odds with a gray market or with efforts to promote legalization of psychedelics, which I also entirely support. You know, I think that the the ideal situation is essentially what has happened with cannabis in New York, where you have everything. That's what I want is everything. I want in the same way that in New York, you have Marinol as an FDA approved federally legal treatment that is THC. Then on a state level, you have medical mm. cannabis products, vapes and things like that, that can be prescribed by a physician then it's also legal for you to sell cannabis to your friend. And there, there will be dispensaries that are taxed at where the, hmm. you know, and they, they even had, um, you know, various efforts to ensure that the dispensary licenses were preferentially given to people who are victims of the war on drugs. Whether or not that will actually pan out as hoped is another question. I've heard some people debate whether that um, truly empowers the people who were. Right. Because I guess there's an idea that, it's often the case that the licenses are then just sold to somebody else. It's true. So it doesn't That's kind of what happened in Cali. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't yeah. have a long term empowering effect on. But there's no prohibited products really in New York. Is that right? Like pretty much anything I'm seeing in Colorado, you can see in New York. Yeah. As, as yeah. I understand it, you can grow cannabis, you can sell cannabis, you can possess cannabis, you can get a prescription for Marinol, you can get a prescription for a cannabis vape and mm. virtually everything in between. And I think that's the goal is freedom mm. so that everyone can do whatever it is they want to do. And if you don't like pharmaceuticals, then you cannot use a pharmaceutical. And if you don't like things that are grown by a a hippie type, then you can use a pharmaceutical product or whatever mm -hmm. so that you have the freedom to choose whatever best suits your needs. Cool. I like it. So wrapping on Compass, then like essentially you've got some work through them. You're working at a furious pace, pumping out new molecules, which hopefully someday some of us get to experiment with if they're <laughs> psychoactive uh, in the right ways. <laughs> and um, yeah, it sounds like a cool relationship. Will this, they'll own some of the data, right? And the university would own some of it or how how would that kind of fly, you think? Yeah, yeah. There, there's joint ownership between the university. And then additionally, once things are published, they're published, mm -hmm. they're in the public domain mm -hmm. and things can be done with that. I mean, that's the, the funny thing is people talk about all of this stuff as if it's so evil. It's, it's not as if Hoffman didn't patent the things that he right. created or Shulgin had, um, you know, a patent for, for the 2,5-dimethoxy amphetamines or for alkyl 2,5-dimethoxy amphetamines. He had a patent for the uh, Ariadne derivatives. So he was trying to have them approved for treatment of Parkinson's and senile dementia with shearing. And there was uh, also a patent for radioisotopes of bromine being used as tracers. He, there was a patent application for methylone. I mean, Shulgin always wanted to work with industry and get these things approved as medicines. That was always the point. He wanted them to go through the FDA. He wanted them to be available to physicians and the people that wanted to use them. That was the kind of, he never, you know, Shulgin wasn't like a, some kind of anti-capitalist crusader who's trying to destroy industry. I mean, he also recognized, because keep in mind, he's 
doing the seminal research at the very beginning at Dow at the time when they're manufacturing napalm for the Vietnam War. So I think that he was able to recognize that you can use funds from mm -hmm. a big corporation and you can do very good work with that money. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the reality. Shulkin wasn't working on napalm. He was working on DOM. That's what was happening. And then he used that money to fund the construction of his own lab and to do the research that we all know and love. So I think that it's if you let your idealism cloud the recognition that this is an opportunity to do amazing research, then nobody wins. I mean, I, I really can't see a scenario where a bunch of chemists passionately researching something they care so much about is bad. And people say, oh, it's a bubble, it's gonna burst. Well, if that's the case, then all the more reason to use this opportunity to get as much research done as possible. It yeah. feels like a dream to me. Right. Yeah. Like we need a lot more molecules. We need drug companies to help us go through this whole thing. Unless people are thinking 5-Amino DMT and ayahuasca are all the medicines you need, which there's people out there that think that, but it's like, we need a lot more drugs than that. We need, there's so many diseases that we have to address. Um, so many people suffering. And there's just, I think that throughout medical history, serendipity has been one of the most important forces you know, a lot of those important pharmaceuticals and chemicals that are known were discovered completely accidentally. One example would be LSD, uh, mm -hmm. but also things like Viagra and Rogaine and oh, you could just go on and on. So many different compounds, uh, hmm. bremelanotide. So we don't know what we don't know. I mean, Chuck Nichols, who's the son of David Nichols and a esteemed pharmacologist in his own right, uh, has been doing a lot of research on the anti-inflammatory effects of psychedelics. And one of the things that he found that is most interesting is that the anti-inflammatory structure activity relationship does not match the serotonergic one. Mm. So you have compounds that people might have thought, oh, that, that's just some thing. That's just a footnote in PCAL. That doesn't mean anything to anyone, mm. especially compared to ayahuasca or 5-MeO-DMT or LSD. Who cares about, I'm not going to name the compound because I'm not sure that he's published it, but a compound that let's say no one cares about. Turns out that compound has the most potent anti-inflammatory effect of them all. Mm. And so this is what happens when you do basic exploratory research, when you actually start testing things. You will find things that you didn't know that you were looking for. And that's, I think, one of the most valuable aspects of all of this is what are we going to find out that we didn't even know that we were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I'm excited for a whole host of reasons, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, what, 40, 50 years left before a total climate shit show. So we've got a lot of work to do to hopefully engineer our way out of that. Maybe with smart drugs, creative problem solving, and a few other things, we can maybe right the ship before the shit starts flying. But maybe. We'll see. Have you have you looked at that creativity stuff that Fadiman was a part of way back? Yeah. 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 Like, I know scientists who have done really incredible things, and, you know, they're in their labs at MIT blowing lines of crystal psilocybin and then you know continuing to work all night on and create really incredible stuff and it materializes later it like actually comes true i'm sure that can go both ways but. yes I, I think it can but uh, yeah you know of course there's carrie mullis and the discovery of pcr and the mm. i think still debated possibility that uh francis crick had taken lsd around the time that the double helical structure mm -hmm. of dna was discovered and yeah, it's, it's clear that in problem solving, it can be helpful to do something that forces you to think about the problem differently. And that might be a psychedelic, it might be something else entirely. But I think that that should not be too controversial of an idea. Yeah. And, you know, as far as I'm aware, no one's really doing it the way Fadman proposed. So I think, um, or was executing on it way back then with others. So I'm, I'm hopeful. <laughs> But, you know, it takes people in labs to make massive change often. And, you know, you're playing a part. Now you're doing the work and I'm excited. So thanks for being open about Compass. I know it's kind of a tough topic probably at this point. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I really don't, it, it's like, I wish people could recognize that it's, what it's about is Jason. It's not about Compass. It's mm-hmm. just about doing the research we've always done and now having an opportunity to really take it to the next level. Where is he? Is he in this lab or is he elsewhere? He's, well, he's not here not, right yeah, at this right. exact moment, but yeah, we're sitting awesome. sitting across from his office. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, Hamilton, anything else you want to shout out or talk about? Uh, I have a podcast on Patreon that deals with psychedelic chemistry and drug policy issues. And I, yeah, that's maybe one thing. And otherwise, I don't know, keep your eyes out for the, for the publications when they start to emerge. Scientific publications, I mean. And you've got a couple fundraising projects probably still ongoing related to cream oh, and the toad. Yes, yes. Yeah, the the fourth edition of the Buffal Various Pamphlet, which is a reprint of the original text by Ken Nelson with a preface that tells the story of how Ken Nelson discovered Buffal Various Venom as well as a section dedicated to a process for the sustainable synthesis of 5-MeO-DMT is currently available. I think last time I checked, there were maybe 500 copies remaining, and this is probably going to be the last edition Mm -hmm. of it. So 100% of the profit goes to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. You can get it at, uh, if you type in cream shop, big cartel, it will come up or it's on my Twitter. And um, yeah, it's an interesting historical document and it has some fun chemistry as well fun and potentially useful <laughs> yeah i need to grab a couple of copies uh, so as soon as they're out i am all right cool hamilton morris thank you so much thank you yeah i hope we get to do it again and there you have it everybody hamilton morris of hamilton's pharmacopoeia i hope you all loved it i certainly did newfound appreciation for hamilton and uh just really thankful for his projects around 5-MeO-DMT and uh, Sonoran Desert Toad conservation initiatives. It's a really delicate situation out there in the desert ecosystem. So play carefully. Squeeze a chemist when you can, not a toad. Yeah. <laughs> According to the data, there's no uh, subjective difference in the experience. Best I recall the uh, reports of the data. All right. Yeah. Again, if you want to support us, please, please, please join us or buy a friend a ticket to the Microdose Wonderland conference coming up November 8 and 9 in Miami. You can buy tickets at microdose.buzz. Use the code psychedelics today to save 20%. And there's, yeah, a bunch of different tiers of tickets. Um, There's going to be a lot of different companies represented there and famous people in the space. Yeah. If you (laughs) just hear the list of people coming, you'll, you'll be pretty impressed. Um, I know uh, Matt Johnson's going to be there. Some really interesting folks in the ketamine space are going to be there. For some reason, I think Robin Carhart Harris will be there. I hope I'm right because it would be lovely to meet him. Yeah. And um, yeah, I hope to meet you there. So again, November 8, 9, Psychedelics Day is the code. And um, yeah, see you in Miami. All right, everybody, signing off for now. This is Joe Moore. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and see you next time. 